March the 25th, thousands of people gathered in Minsk, the capital of Belarus, to celebrate the centenary of the proclamation of the first Belarusian People's Republic in 1918, which was swept away a few months later by the Bolsheviks. A commemoration never officially recognized by the regime of Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. For many, March the 25th, so-called Freedom Day, is the true symbol of Belarusian identity. <laughs> Just like the former white and red flag replaced by Lukashenko in 1995. It was banned for years, but authorized that day in the perimeter of the celebrations. I hope uh, it will be a start of maybe our new freedom. Uh, we, because Belarusians are not free in Belarus. The event has attracted thousands of people today on the square, but for others who tried to rally in another part of town earlier this morning, things did not run so smoothly. An hour before the start of the authorized celebrations, another event, banned by the authorities, was short lived. A few dozen opponents of the regime and ordinary citizens had gathered in another part of the city to march through the center to the site of the celebrations. But that was in vain. People have been trying to stage a rally before the official BNR celebrations, but they're being arrested one after the other. Dozens of people were arrested in Minsk and across the country. Today is a celebration. Why arrest people? No. We have a real dictatorship. We have neither freedom of expression nor decent work for people. It's a discontent which the famous opponent and ex-presidential candidate in 2010, Mikolai Statkovich, wants to answer. We had met him a few days earlier with his wife, Marina. The couple had not left their home for several days to avoid a possible arrest before the March 25th events. They're under constant surveillance. Here, the radio is constantly on. They have a listening system. We make noise so that they can hear us less. <laughs> Mikolai was arrested during a severe crackdown on massive protests against Lukashenko's re-election in 2010. His release, along with several other political prisoners in 2015, led to the lifting of most of the European sanctions against Belarus. But the repression has not stopped, according to the opponent, who says he spent a total of eight years of his life in prison. This is not a free country. People have no influence on power. There still are political prisoners and they're tortured. This country suffocates people. It's hard to breathe here. Fear reigns all the time. If nobody talks about freedom in the country, if no one fights for it, then people forget that freedom exists. The society is disintegrating and the country becomes an easy prey for any outside force. Now Lukashenko is supported by Putin and Putin is much more popular than Lukashenko in Belarus. This makes the potential annexation of Belarus very easy and attractive for Putin. We want a normal future for our country, so we'll continue to go out on the streets. Our interview is suddenly interrupted. It's Nikolai Sivchik and Vinyaski, is it? Yes, we're in our house. We're at home. We will try it. At a home there is urine use, so I think they won't do anything to us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
But Statkovic was arrested four days later in front of his home as he was attempting to join the banned rally in March before the BNR celebrations. Long live Belarus! Most of those who were arrested that day were released the same evening. The muzzling of the protest was more muffled than in the same period last year. Thousands of citizens had joined in opposition protests for several weeks against a decree imposing a tax on unemployed people, the so-called parasite tax. Ordinary citizens, activists, journalists, hundreds of protesters were arrested. The decree was abolished by the government early this year. We have an appointment at the premises of the only independent union in the country. Here, support and legal advice is offered to people going through hardship. Vladimir and Dmitry became activists after being targeted by the parasite tax last year. Vladimir had demonstrated in 2017 for the first time in his life. I was arrested and put in a cell without light, without ventilation, without explanations, without a lawyer, without the right to inform my relatives. I received a maximum fine of 350 euros, which weighed heavily on my family budget. And so, branded as an opponent, it's become even more difficult to find work. With decree number three, I started paying more attention to new policies and I began to study the laws so that I knew how to protect myself. Like many in Belarus, both men work abroad to support themselves. With the crisis, incomes have plummeted and jobs are scarce. A new decree is on its way raising new concerns. This time it could require the unemployed to pay their social contributions in full. A family who earns enough money has other thoughts in mind and thinks freely. And authoritarian power does not need people who think freely. When people everywhere live in semi-poverty, they don't think about global things. They only think about their own survival. This is the difference between a democracy and an authoritarian regime. But the union is under pressure. The premises are under sequestration and hundreds of the union members are under investigation. A few days after our meeting, Dmitry was also arrested at the March 25th unauthorized gathering. The space for protest remains more than limited in Belarus, where the KGB set in this building still exists under this name. Free speech, like the media, is under tight control. But the authoritarian regime of Alexander Lukashenko seems to want to loosen its grip. Since the annexation of Crimea by Russia, on which Belarus depends economically, Minsk has more reason than ever to try to please the European Union. The regime must improve its record on freedoms and human rights, admits the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Changes are in sight, but Moscow must be handled with care. Well, we sit down here, we will reorganize the, the seats. We cannot uh, uh, go to bed in the Soviet Union and uh, wake up in the totally European uh, democratic state. It does not mean that uh, we don't want uh, to learn, but uh, we would like to look at this uh, situation, let's say, in a greater context. Because today we are thinking about maybe possible changes of our constitution. Because, uh, the situation uh, in Belarus and around Belarus has changed uh, regarding the, for instance, uh, security issues, uh, Ukrainian crisis. That's why uh, the authorities of Belarus would like to move forward very cautiously in order to maintain the stability in this society. It's a slow pace, which part of the country's youth is tired of. 
Senya often comes here to the Minsk subway just to make ends meet. The rest of the time, she is a teacher in a village located a hundred kilometers from the capital. We met her again when she got back from school. Her 200 euro monthly salary barely allows her to live. Yeah, the route is costing me half of my salary, eh? Okay, can you tell us about the wood? Another dent in her salary, the three official newspapers she's forced to buy every week. Propaganda, she says. Every teacher must have them. Why? Uh, what, what are they about? About uh, our policy and about the state and the rules and everything, I don't know. But I don't uh, really uh, read them. But they are very good for fire. <laughs> the hardest part, says Ksenia, is the ideological pressure at school. Everybody is um, afraid of something, you know. Mm -hmm. Every teacher is just afraid of the director. The director is afraid of the uh, higher, uh, just high people, I don't know. And uh, this atmosphere of... Uh, I don't know, it's not freedom. Maybe for an old person who, have lived, uh, uh, who has lived his uh, whole life in the Soviet Union, it's very good. Maybe, I don't know. But for young people, it's deadly. Uh, it's dead. Uh, no progress, no uh, independence. No future. And a lot of police, everywhere police. In a neighboring village, we meet Somali, a young Belarusian rapper. <laughs> With the money he earned abroad, he bought this house. He set up his recording studio here. The musician is one of those who last year had received the so-called letter of happiness, summoning him to pay the parasite tax targeting the unemployed. That inspired him to write a song. In his video, he burns the letter of the tax department and claims his thirst for freedom. Living here in the country, I feel more free than if I were in town. For now, I have no problem with the authorities. I'm talking about everything I want. I say everything I think. But maybe I don't have any problems because they haven't listened to me yet. country torn between its Soviet heritage and its thirst for modernity, two types of youths live side by side. We attend the annual regional forum of the Republican Youth Union of Belarus, or BRSM, the main youth organization of the country. A descendant of the Komsomol movement, the communist youth organization of the former USSR, it is financed by the state. Artyom Yzekenko, activist of Minsk Gorskoy Organization of the Youth Movement. Artyom commands the Brigade for Security and Order of the BRSM in Minsk, which sometimes lends a hand to the police. At his side, 21-year-old Yegor. He heads the youth chamber at the Minsk City Council of Deputies.
The commitment of these young people to the homeland and its government is unfaltering. My most important value is the love for my homeland, patriotism, the patriotic sentiment. This is taught to us from childhood at school. The country has not lost the most important values. It's not lost the respect of its people. It pays special attention to every citizen, to every small town, to every village and every road. That's why when you arrive in Belarus, you see a very clean country. A country which every day takes care of every citizen. That's why maybe we can feel that here there is a great stability, that everything is very clear-cut. It's another type of national identity Pavel Belavus wants to promote. He opened this shop three years ago. Everything here bears the white and red colors of the old flag. We have games in Belarusian, literature for children and adults in Belarusian, including that of our Nobel Prize winner, Svetlana Alexievich. There are souvenirs, gifts, music. We represent Belarus as it is and as it should be. The very existence of the store is a sign of an opening of the regime, says its founder, albeit very limited. Even if there are positive changes and no one arrests us because of this shop, if I leave here and go somewhere with a red and white flag, the police will come to meet me and I will definitely have problems. The power has two hands. One allows, the other forbids. One caresses and the other beats. And we're in between these two hands, trying to avoid falling in one hand or the other. Pavel was also the main organizer of the festivities scheduled for the 25th of March. We're going to get some flyers. Let's go. Yeah, we'll put that on the stage. Long live Belarus. We see police cordons, there are arrests. But we got here and it's because people wanted it, not because we were allowed to do it. These are the people who wanted this event and that's why we succeeded. But reality quickly took over. We learned that after the concert, a few dozen of those who had lingered in the streets with their flags were arrested by the police. But Pavel's enthusiasm has been shared widely, if only for a few hours. Today we've proved that nobody should be afraid of us, and we're afraid of nothing. We together, we are the nation, we build it, we will live it, we will live on this land, we will speak in Belarusian. White and red flags will be flown. Thank you. Long live Belarus.